Hey everyone, the golden era of Astros baseball continues, but the Texas Rangers are waiting and there's a lot of bad blood. Plus, is Montrose about to become more walkable? And Kroger is unveiling a new store just in time to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. Pulitzer Prize finalist Evan Mintz and author Shiam Galyon join me to recap the biggest stories from the week. It's Friday, October 13th, 2023. I'm Raheel Ramzanali, and here's what Houston's talking about. Shiam, welcome back. It's been a while. Good morning, Evan. Good morning. It's Friday the 13th. So I want to start with this. Do you have a Friday the 13th tradition, whether it be something unlucky, watching a scary movie? Tell me. Come on, Shiam. Do you have one? Yeah, I like to go to Common Bond and just have like whatever pumpkin dessert that they have. And then if I have a random conversation with one of their super friendly staff, I might say something like, oh, yeah, I also do psychic readings. Do you want one? And then say something spooky. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. How about you, Evan? No, I don't have anything for Friday the 13th. But what I like to do is just look out for when buildings don't have a 13th floor. You ever go in an elevator and it's like 11, 12, 14, there's no 13th floor. Like that, that's weird to me because we still know there's a 13th floor. It's still there. It's like every other number is off now. That's the real like weird unluckiness in my mind. Yeah, that is always fun. Like looking out for it, you go, okay, which building doesn't have it? Which one does? And then if a building does have it, do you go on the 13th floor? Because I don't, you know what? You know what I don't want? I don't want bad luck. I'm good. I'll just pass on that. So yeah, that's a good one. My tradition has always been to fire up USA Network because they used to show scary movie marathons on Friday the 13th. And my brother and I used to stay up and watch those and then be scared for the rest of the week. So I just like watching scary movies on there. And even though I'll turn the volume down because I'm I'm a little chicken, okay? I don't like scary <laughs> movies, but it's just that nostalgia, right? So I like doing that, just firing up the USA Network. So there you go. All right, Shiam, let's start with you. Biggest story of the week. What do you got? So my biggest story is so big that I'm still looking at the headlines for it. I think it's safe to say that the whole world has their eyes and hearts like on this. So last week, an area in Palestine called Gaza, it's been blockaded by both Israel and the blockade has been supported by Egypt as well since 2007. And for the past 75 years, Palestinian people have been resisting the Israeli occupation. But since the blockade in Gaza, specifically, you've seen people resist the blockade as well. Um, And the past decade, we've seen people um, resist in all sorts of ways. What particularly comes to mind is like in 2018, there was something called the Great Return March, where young people, you know, civil society type folks, journalists, medical professionals, etc., like we're just walking to the border um, and the Israeli military shot them and there were like massacres there, basically like t- a huge civilian death toll. So in following with global trends of how things have become more extreme, Israeli security forces have become more extreme. The rhetoric in Israel has become more extreme. And earlier, a few days ago, Hamas broke out of Gaza it's important to remember, it's like an open air prison. Um, and they started taking military hostages. And um, this was huge and a big news story because Israel's big narrative is how strong and secure they are. And that, that Hamas broke out essentially and um, was able to take so many hostages was like, whoa, like uh, a very emotional moment for anyone who has family or has been connected to the occupation or just has friends and has been following the situation. And then things things were happening very rapidly. And in, in addition to military hostages, there was a civilian massacre at a festival. Um, but Israel immediately like clamped down, declared an emergency government, mobilized, I think, a fourth of its population. Um, so pulled in people from reserves. So 300,000 military members are now kind of positioned to totally besiege Gaza and power has been shut off from Gaza. 
and Israel already started bombing Gaza. And I was talking to friends here in Houston about like how Houston fits into all of this, how the United States, you know, fits into all of this. Um, you know, President Biden gave remarks. And I think one thing that's really important to remember is that um, our main relationship to Israel is military and security. And our biggest product on the world stage is weapons. Um, and so I, I think that's like a huge thing to remember is that um, it's happening on on a land somewhere else, but like our tax dollars are, you know, everything, it, it we're all connected. I actually spoke with um, a lot of the Houston City Cast folks, including Evan, and we were talking about this and um, about all the different layers of like how this relates to Houston. So Evan, I kind of want to pass the mic to you, actually. You know, I, I think for, for the Jewish community, this is this is visceral and real and devastating to see the, the ramifications of this Hamas slaughter of innocent civilians at a concert. It is awful. This week, there was a community gathering at Beth Yashurin where my family belongs just to gather in solidarity and pray for peace. But, you know, right now, my kids you know, school, their preschool they attend is under security alert because of threats they get. And this isn't anything, you know, new. Things pile out of the Middle East and land here in America. And uh, I've just been in shock this whole week. Um, and it's just awful to watch. Yeah, Shiam, this is a very deeply personal story for a lot of folks in the Houston community. How much has community helped during this week? Houston is has a large Jewish community. Evan is actually like, I think we've talked before, their grandpa came here, one of the first, I think. Um, also has a very large Palestinian community. A lot of Palestinians either have family here or have moved through here. Um, you know, like when Evan and I were talking earlier, we were like, oh yeah, this is very much like 9-11 in the sense of a few different dynamics. Like there were Israeli civilians that were killed. Um, similar to 9-11, American civilians killed. Any other final points about Houston that anybody wants to make? I, I would say just that I wish the world could look at Houston as a place where people from around the world live side by side in peace where we cheer for the Astros together, where we get stuck in traffic together. And just the reality of day-to-day -day life shows that we have more in common than what separates us. Uh, and I just think that's one of the great things about living in the city and living in America. And I've always thought that that is kind of our great export to the world, is the vision of living like that. All right, Evan, it's funny you mentioned the Houston Astros as a uniting factor here in the city of Houston. That is my biggest story of the week. The golden era of Houston Astros baseball continues as the Astros beat the Twins earlier this week to set up a match against the South Oklahoma Rangers. That's what we're calling them in the <laughs> ALCS. All right. This is the Astros seventh straight championship series and only the Braves have reached more in a row, which was eight during their runs in the 90s. Now on to the Rangers. There's a lot of bad blood between the two, obviously, because they play each other in the regular season for the silver boot. The Astros have owned that series for a long time. This past year, there were some heated games as well. But it all boils down to 2017 when after Hurricane Harvey, the Houston Astros had a series at Minute Maid Park, which they couldn't play because, well, the entire city was underwater and resources, staff, it was impossible for them to get to Minute Maid Park. So the Astros suggested that they play the series up in Arlington. And in return, the Astros would play the series that was scheduled later in the season in Arlington at Minute Maid Park. So it was just a home and home flip. Well, of course, the Rangers were like, no, we're good. We don't want to do that unless you guys just play all six games here and you can be the home team. We'll give you the funds and all that good stuff. And the Astros were like, no, that's going to be three home games. So they had to fly to Tropicana Field to play their home series, which was supposed to be at Minute Maid Park in Florida and take the players away from their family, take resources away from the city. And it just started this whole drama of like, really? Come on. This is what we're doing. Arlington is you're not going to just concede this home and home series. 
you don't want to do this? Nope. And now there's so much bad blood and there's players from that team still on this team. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Fans are going to be obnoxious. I love it. The series starts on Sunday for a chance to go to the World Series. So proud of the Astros because it was a crazy season filled with injuries, ups and downs, and yet they won the AL West, they won the ALDS, and now they're on to the ALCS. I just got to say, I'm impressed that a small town like Arlington can have a baseball team. It's just who knew, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I can't wait to see the Astros uh, kick their butts, win, and let's get us to the World Series. Yep, let's get back there and maybe capture a third title during this run, which would be incredible. And it's so much fun to see all of the Astros gifts, see the Astros jerseys out and about. And there's nothing like baseball fever in the city of Houston. It is Houston's biggest team now. It doesn't matter that we have an NFL team. I'm telling you, the Astros are more important. So I love seeing it. I'm doing my part by going to Minneapolis this weekend. And... (laughs) And uh, I'll be bringing like House of Pies pecan pie and just like taunting everyone. So nice. that's my you better contribution. Wear Astros gear. Yeah, I'm gonna get my. St- I'm gonna take stickers and leave them on their like public signs and stuff. <laughs> I love it. Okay, Evan, on to you. What is your biggest story of the week? Oh, the biggest story this week is watching Texas Republicans fight over Nazi cash. A special session that was supposed to be about private school vouchers is now focusing on whether Dan Patrick is going to return $3 million in swastika bucks that he got. Now, what am I talking about? There's a political action committee in Texas, the Defend Texas Liberty Pact, which has given millions upon millions to Texas Republicans. But this week, PAC President Jonathan Stickland, a former representative, was found hosting anti-Semitic white supremacist Nick Fuentes at his office for nearly seven hours. Now, I know sometimes conservatives say, oh, you progressives, they're not really Nazis. Like, no, like this guy praises Hitler. He's called for a holy war against Jews. He's denied the Holocaust. He said all that he wants is revenge against his enemies and a total Aryan victory. This guy is a Nazi. And he's got not Democrats calling for accountability against this PAC and Republicans who took their money, but other Republicans. House Speaker Dade Phelan has said that it is indicative of the moral and political rot that's been festering in certain segments of the Republican Party. Anti-Semitism, bigotry, Hitler apologists should find no sanctuary in the Republican Party, he said. And 60 members of the Texas House Republican Caucus have lined up behind him, releasing a similar statement. Now, a bunch of Texas representatives and state senators, to their credit, have returned some of the cash they've received from this PAC and said they didn't know, they don't want to be associated with it, they're done. Others haven't. Alexandra Mueller, for example, received $100,000 from this PAC in the 2022 election for county judge. We've got no word from her on this. And Dan Patrick, who received $3 million from them during the Ken Paxton impeachment, has not only refused to return the cash or give it to some charity, but has doubled down in defending himself and the organization. Now, I've got to point out that Defend Texas Liberty is funded by two West Texas billionaires, Tim Dunn and Ferris Wilkes, who also happen to be the Attorney General Ken Paxton's biggest donors. It is a shame and it is terrifying to see this sort of white supremacy that we thought was shoved into the corners of society, into the shadows, be given a bright light by the Texas Republican Party. And I'm heartened to see folks like Speaker Phelan stand up for what is right. Yeah, that three million dollar blunder, as Dan Patrick called it, is so fascinating because he's just like, whatever. You know what? I'm still keeping this money. He's got 20 million. He doesn't need the 3 million. He would look really good if he gave that money away to charity, but he's not going to do it because he views this as some sort of big partisan fight rather than viewing it as a simple question of right and wrong. And I think that's a larger problem we're seeing in our politics these days that people only see things through that partisan lens. They can't just stand up for some of the clear cut black and white issues. Evan, can you tell me about this influencer marketing that the pack is running as well? Because I saw this when reading Robert Downen's story, who, by the way, just shows you how important local reporting and state reporting really is, because if he doesn't uncover this and follows the money, then we don't know about this and just how deep this goes. But they're also running these influencer campaigns that they got $18,000 for. And this is how the rhetoric starts. Oh, yeah. Robert Downen is a treasure. 
He's at the Texas Tribune, and he's really one of the great journalists in our state. And he found that this PAC was paying influencers online to spread messages in support of Ken Paxson. But also, when you give money to sort of the worst people out there, you support them in their spread of terrible messages about hate, about white supremacy in Texas. I mean, there's this internet meme out there of uh, some Republican going, well, gosh, I, I was canceled for my conservative views. Like, oh, you got canceled for calling for lower taxes? Like, no, 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 no. Oh, you got canceled for calling for less regulation? Like, no, not those views. Well, then what views do you get canceled for? You know, the ones. And we're seeing the ones out there get a big, bold support by members of the Republican Party in Texas. And it is just awful to watch. And it is terrifying. And you can find that full story and all of Robert's reporting in the Texas Tribune with the link in our show notes. It is a must read. All right, let's get to our most overlooked stories of the week. Shiam, what do you got for us? So in grocery news, you know, first we had Fiesta and then HUB came in with the Mi Tienda. And now Kroger has their own Hispanic market. It's at um, Beltway 8 and I-45 South. And for all the grocery store aficionados and lovers of Mexican food and culture, it's definitely something to check out. Yeah, I love that Kroger is now expanding into the market and really providing us a place to go get some delicious groceries, delicious foods. And they've got so many options like the cafeteria there. They got a juicery. And it's almost like Mi Tienda, as you brought up. H-E-B has done this and they have a few locations. It is so awesome. I love this and it is so cool to see that grocery stores are, well, catering to the local community. All right, Evan, let's get to you. What is your most overlooked story of the week? The most overlooked story, I'm going to go to the Texas Tribune again, which teamed up with ProPublica on an expose that Texas had been allowing charter school systems to expand, even though they had failing campuses. On at least 17 occasions, Mike Morath, who's the head of education in Texas, had waived the expansion requirements for charter networks that had too many failing campuses to qualify. Uh, Before Mike Morath took over, only three such performance waivers had been granted, but afterwards, 17. For example, one campus that opened because of the waiver was the East Tex Jensen Neighborhood School, which is just six miles away from Wheatley High School, whose own struggling scores as a member of HISD helped prompt a takeover at a state level. But the last time the state scored schools, this charter received 48 out of 100, which is considered failing under the state's accountability system. In fact, Morath has repeatedly given exemptions to schools under the Texas College Preparatory Academies, the charter network to which Eats Tex belongs. And it's worth noting that Greg Abbott has lobbied for the expansion and creation of private school vouchers at a campus run by the Texas College Preparatory Academy. And by the way, it's worth noting that the uh, organization that oversees these charters has made headlines for trying to teach creationism in schools and a failed effort to create statewide private school vouchers in partnership with a small public school district. Really weird stuff. And I just think at a time when the state has taken over HISD for purportedly failing schools, even though, you know, they brought their scores back up. How can we take that legitimately if they're letting charters expand with failing schools? And at a time when the state legislature is trying to push for the creation of private school vouchers, we can see that the state isn't taking accountability seriously. They're creating an uneven playing field. The state should have to live by its own standards before they do any step in a new direction. The whole point of charters, the whole point of vouchers is to say, oh, we're going to create a competitive marketplace. The bad ones will fail and the good ones will succeed. But if you're letting the bad ones succeed, then you have no justification for any of this. It drives me nuts to see this. Mike Morath needs to answer questions about why he let these failing campuses expand. And I think people need to stand up and call BS on all of this. Charters and public schools should be treated the same. If you're failing, you're failing. If you're succeeding, you're succeeding. Don't mush it all up. And the reporter for that story from ProPublica and Texas Tribune, Kia Collier, is going to join us on Monday's episode to talk about exactly what you brought up, right? Like, how does the charter school's failure 
kind of lead to what's going to happen with the private school vouchers and that program if it does pass. So uh, we'll have that episode on Monday as well and and have a deeper dive into her reporting. Well, I can't wait to listen. All right, I'm going to go to my most overlooked story of the week. And we've talked about the steps that HPD is taking to clean up prostitution on Bissonette Street. And this week, another domino fell. Larry Lavish Lewis, a.k.a. the king of Bissonette, was found guilty of sex trafficking for women using force and coercion and of taking the women across state lines to engage in prostitution, not only here, but also in other states. Now, during the trial, Lewis's victim described how Lewis lured them into forced prostitution with false promises of good money and a good life. And it's just so sad to see this happen, but so good to see that there are steps being taken to clean this up because Lewis confiscated the identification cards of the two women and tightly controlled access to their hotel rooms. The women were completely dependent on him for food, lodging, and basic necessities. According to officials, U.S. District Judge Randy Crane has set Lewis's sentencing for January 10th, and Lewis will face up to life in prison. So steps are being taken, dominoes are falling to not only end sex trafficking here in the city of Houston, but also clean up a part of the city that has been such a big part of that sex trafficking and prostitution. No, I am so glad to see this. Now, I remember when I was in the prosecutor's office in the misdemeanor courts, and you'd see these prostitution cases come through, and you just feel bad. You're arresting the women who are in dire straits often, who have been trafficked, who are the victims in this, not the perpetrators. Finally, to get the guy at the top feels like you can make a real difference and you're getting the right person. But I also want to point out, when you're kind of like the self-proclaimed king of Bissonette, isn't that like an admission to guilt? It's like naming yourself, I'm the sultan of assault, like I'm the top bad guy. Like you basically have told the cops, please come arrest me. Yeah, it really is telling everyone like, hey, this is me, guys. Yeah. I am him. So, yeah, it's crazy, like that nickname. Now, I don't know if it's a self-appointed nickname or if that's just what the cops called him or the community calls him. I don't know. But, yeah, that is a crazy thing. All right, let's get to our moment of joy before we wrap this episode up. Shiam, what do you got for us? So I'm going to be spending the weekend just connecting and staying close to friends. It's not going to be a weekend of joy, but it is going to be a weekend of connection. That's awesome. That's going to be a good weekend to hopefully reconnect and just fill that spirit back up in the soul, right? And that's that's so important. Mm-hmm. Especially during really hard times. And so I'm going to be checking in on every Palestinian I know and every anti-Zionist Jew I know because this is really shitty. No, it's definitely it's a it's it's a very tough tough time and discussion to have. Um, but I think it, you did a good job setting it up. Yeah, in, in the beginning. Mm-hmm. All right, Evan, let's talk about you. What is your moment of joy for the week? Oh, my moment of joy was seeing people stand up to defend a walkability plan proposed by the Montrose Turs. Now, for those who don't know, there's a proposal by the Tax Increment Reinvestment Zone in Montrose to expand sidewalks, to create buffers between the street and the sidewalks, to add in bike paths so that people can bike. It will be amazing. But folks saw the plan and realized that it also involves removing some existing trees, and they didn't want that to happen. They care about the trees. So they passed around a petition and got more than 5,000 signatures. But people are now pushing back, pointing out that if you really care about the environment, you should want the area to be more walkable. Let folks get out of their cars. It's more about the actual impact rather than the aesthetics of trees. And also that the overall plan will result in a net positive of trees, 137 new trees to create a more comprehensive canopy all up and down mantras that will last for the next generation because trees grow and trees die. And some of the trees they're taking out are at the end of their lives. And rather than letting them fall into disrepair or letting disease spread, they are renewing the area. And I'm just so happy to see this because we talk about Montrose as if it's a walkable area. But if you actually try to get around there, particularly if you've got a stroller, which I often do, it ain't that walkable. We are just catching up with the baseline of where we should be. And I'm so, so happy. That's going to be good to see how it looks in the future. And I love that you pointed out the cycle of life there. Some trees will die. And you know what? You need to maintain the rest of the the area. We need to put new Mm -hmm. trees in. So I like that. It will be a net positive. 
Okay, my moment of joy, you know, we've talked a lot about the fall festivals and things to do that really get fall going for you. But to me, my annual fall getaway is volunteering at my daughter's Girl Scouts camp, which happens in early October. And this is the best because it officially marks the changing of seasons for me. I get to spend time with my daughter and her troop and the other dads as well. So there's going to be about 20 dads going and volunteering at this overnight camp for the weekend. And it is so much fun because you get to see these girls break barriers, get to do adventures that you normally wouldn't get a chance to do here, just living in the city of Houston. So I am pumped to see that. And I get to reconnect with other dads and just talk to them and hang out with them because when do we get time to do that? So this is my official beginning of fall. And from here on out, I've got stuff planned every week, whether it be pumpkin patch photos, you've got Thanksgiving coming up in a month or so. So everything just kind of falls in place beginning with this annual Girl Scouts camp. So I'm pumped for that. I'm excited. Well, that sounds wonderful. And this isn't just some sort of scheme to get like front row to cookies, right? Like that's not why you're doing this. <laughs> no, if you're a Girl Scout dad, the cookie season is the worst part of the year because <laughs> you have to go get all the cookies. You have to pick up dozens of boxes of cookies and deliver them. It's not my daughter who's delivering these cookies. It's me. <laughs> so you know what? I am not a fan of Girl Scout cookie season. That's why I love this time. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Shiam, Evan, thank you so much for joining us this week. That was a lot of fun, and we will talk to you down the road. Thanks, y'all. Chat with y'all next week. That was Shiam Galyan and Evan Mintz. All of the stories we discussed are linked in our show notes. That will do it for this week here on CityCast Houston. Our lead producer is Dina Kespa. Our producer is Carleon Jones. Our newsletter editor is Brooke Lewis. And the host is me, Raheel Ramzanali. Our music is by the band All the Kimonos. We'll be back on Monday with a look at how the Texas Education Agency failed students. Thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something new. Did everybody lose Evan or was it me? Or, it was just or you. did I go out? I think it was just me. Okay. W- what did you say? <laughs>